Hi again. Today we're going to talk about shifting. So shifting, of course, is a technique which allows us to transport the hand from one part of our instrument to another. So for example, we call the first note on the string first position. And if let's say I were to place my first finger where maybe the third note on that string would be, that's what we term third position. Right? So uh, there's a couple considerations physically about shifting. And the first one is that the thumb and the first finger must travel together. So you're going to notice that I always have the tip of my first finger across from the thumb. And as I'm shifting, they do travel together. They're not going to do what I call a caterpillar crawl, which is one at a time. And um, the other thing that's important is we don't want to be shifting from our wrist, right? You may see something like this. That's not really what we're trying to do. The most efficient thing that you can do is actually from the elbow and even a little bit from the armpit. So the shifting motion actually acts kind of like an accordion. So if you see, if I just do my elbow, I'm creating kind of a semicircle in the air. I don't want to hop up out of the viola to do my shift. So I actually have to use a little bit of that armpit shrinking too. So you can kind of see it almost looks like an accordion kind of slinking in and slinking out. And both of these joints allow my wrist and hand to be on one plane or one level, okay? Um, so when I talk about shifting or I talk about music in general, I'm always big about the five senses. And unless you have a condition called synesthesia, you can't taste or smell music, but you can see it, you can hear it, and you can feel it. So I'm up here visual auditory and kinesthetic. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So when we think of a basic shift, uh, you can sense it in one of these three ways. And I prefer to do it in all three of these ways. So let's just talk about the visual, for example. So let's just say I'm going from first position to third position. Let's say I'm on the D string. I'm playing a first finger. And I want to go to a third finger G on the D string. Again, that's where my third note on the string would be. And if I can get my thumb and my first finger to go there, now I'm in third position. So, visually, I can literally see that my ring finger ends right there. So, I can place a visual marker, as I like to call it, right here. And if I can get my thumb and my first finger to replace that, that specific spot, I can just eyeball that. Even if I was deaf, I could see where my finger has to be. So that's a really helpful way to kind of interpret shifts. Whereabouts do you need to be going? And sometimes you have uh, a specific place, like example, I can see the third finger is there, I make a visual marker, and then I simply let my index finger and my thumb replace that specific spot. And look, I don't have to hear at all. I can just use my eyes. Um, now, uh, we are all different learners. You have your visual learners, your auditory learners, your reading, writing learners, and your, um, what did I say? Is it visual, auditory, reading, writing, and kinesthetic. So some people might really enjoy that visual aspect, and some people might really want to have that auditory. Some people want uh, that kinesthetic feedback. So by using all three, you give yourself a complete picture of how to shift accurately and how to shift well. Um, the second thing, let's talk about auditory. So uh, we have a saying in music, which is, if you can't sing it, you can't play it. And that's absolutely true. If I asked you as an artist to paint me a gobbledygook, what would you paint, right? Uh, for most people, you may not think of anything. You might be like, what is that? Versus if I said, you know, draw a picture of a pig, most of us have seen a pig, so we know what we might draw or what we might visualize. So as part of audiation, um, we need a model, right? And so one of the best things to do is if it's available to you, um, let's say you're shifting, like I said, on this D string, you don't have to know what that sounds like uh, going into it. You can actually play it in the old position. So if I play that third finger G, I can hear it, I can feel the vibrations, I can even sing it. Bum, bum. I can use a tuner, all sorts of different things. So now that I have a model, 
I can then do the shift. And let's say I'm sharp right now. I can like, oh, that doesn't really match what I had heard before. It sounded a little bit lower. And then I can make adjustments from there. I'm like, okay, that sounds about right. That sounds about like what I was looking for initially in my pitch. So that's modeling. And you can always use, let's say, um, a higher string. Let's say you're trying to find, the, I don't know, a harmonic. You're like, oh, well, that note is a D. So if I find the right place, or maybe it's a uh, third finger in the fifth position, I can always go back here and be like, okay, what does that sound like? Or maybe it's something, um, I don't know. You know, I mean, use your imagination there. Singing internally, this is where you kind of have to hold on to a note before you get there so you know where you're going. Uh, the analogy I like to use with my students is if I asked you to go to the store and get me something, which store are you going to and what are you going to get me? And most people would be like, I don't know. What store do you want me to go to? And it's too late. Once you start shifting and you don't know where you're going and you don't know what it is that you're getting, you've already failed, unfortunately. So, again, knowing what the pitch is, and even if I played bum, I can still grab that pitch out of the air because I've memorized it on some level, right? So I can shift to it accurately. And so that's kind of a, a holding state for your pitch using your audiation. Now, um, kinesthetic is kind of an interesting one. I really like it. Uh, you have a skill called proprioception. And what proprioception is, it's the ability for your body to know where it is in space. So for example, and don't try this on people, okay, I'm just doing this as an example. But um, if you try to, let's say, hit yourself in the face, uh, but stop short of it, you're not actually trying to hit yourself in the face, you will actually never hit yourself in the face. We really know where our bodies are. But if I try to slap somebody else in the face, the chances are that I would slap them. The reason why is because as things go away from us, we become less accurate. And as things become in towards us, we become more accurate. Which if you guys are already shifting, you may have already realized that when you're shifting up, you're way more accurate than if you were to have shifted down. Um, so for example, when you're doing your scales, make sure that you're always doing them both ways. Uh, going up is very easy, going down is very hard due to proprioception. Um, but how proprioception helps us is in understanding that as we go up, we can be more confident. As we go down, we have to have a couple other safeguards to make sure that we can be uh, correct. Now, one of the things that I really like is finger painting. And so if you've ever finger painted, you dipped your fingers in paint and then you drag it across, uh, hopefully paper, hopefully not your wall or anything like that. But feeling the string below your finger is really very important to this concept. So as I'm going, I don't want to leap off the string and have no physical contact whatsoever. Not only will it produce an open string in between, but also you can't measure distance, right? So for example, if I were to just like wipe my finger across this whiteboard, I could probably tell that that was about three inches or so, right? Even with my eyes closed, I'm like, okay, that's a one, two, three. Um, the same thing happens with your shifting. You really want to also kind of think about what are the distances you're trying to establish in your shifting. Is this shift from first to third position, is that two inches? Is it three inches? Do I not think in inches? What if it's five gummy bears? right? Whatever makes sense to you, that's what you need to use to explain these concepts to yourself, okay? All right, so now let's get into the actual shifting. There is something that I like to call a replacement shift, and what that is, is basically if you're able to play the new position within your old position. So for example, um, I can play, let's say, a fourth finger on the D string. So if I were to replace my thumb and my first finger using a visual cue, 
to where the fourth finger was, that is actually a replacement shift. I can replace something that was previously there. So for example, first to second, I can replace right there. First to third, first to fourth, and again, visually cue. And again, you know, if you don't make your shift, it's okay. It means one of the things was not making sense to you. So you have to figure out what is it that um, wasn't making sense. Were you maybe rushing? You didn't have enough time to think. Um, were you not using a visual cue or an auditory cue or a kinesthetic cue? Um, and so when you get into places where you didn't shift well, it's always a lack of information. It's not that you're untalented or not intelligent, right? It just means that your brain was missing some information. So um, when you're thinking about shifts of any kind, I have something called, I call a one-to-one -one relationship. So what that means is that we, if let's say you're playing a second finger in first position and you want to go to a third finger in third position, right? It looks at first glance like you're trying to learn how to go from a second finger to a third finger. But what's absolutely true is you're doing what we call one-to-one -one relationships. So behind that second finger was your first finger. And that first finger will go to another first finger uh, in the new position. So in the third position, it goes to here, here. And then from there, you would then build the third finger. So essentially, whether I'm going from here or or um, a weirder shift like that, at the heart of all of those shifts is simply one concept, a first finger in the first position to a first finger in the third position. So all you have to practice, again, is doing a replacement shift. In this case, I would do a playing of the note in the old position. I would listen to it. I would then sing it. And then what I would do is I would lift the weight of the finger on the string until it creates this very wispy, light noise, what we call high frequency impurity. And I would listen the whole way up, being very careful with when do I reach the pitch I'm looking for, the one that I had sang earlier, right? Once I reach it and I decide, oh, I got it, then I will simply drop the weight of the finger in place and secure the pitch. Now, it's nice about lifting some of the weight of the finger so that you're not actually pushing the metal of the string onto the wood of the fingerboard, is that the bow gets to create this white noise. We hear it, but our audience doesn't necessarily hear it if we do it well and light enough. So for here, we can actually hear this and then put it down once we reach and then clarify that sound for our audience, right? So. What I recommend that you guys do at home is to choose uh, two positions within a replacement shift range. So like a first, a second, a first, a third, a first, a fourth. Anything within three positions of itself is a replacement shift, right? And that works going backward and forward. So here's a really great tip. A lot of times we get caught up in a higher position. We're like, uh-oh, how do I get back down? Uh, knowing that proprioception says that as I go further away from my face, I become less accurate. And the reality is this. If I'm playing this, maybe it's my first finger. And I can say, okay, what does my first finger become in the next position? And I go, okay, well, this is a third position. I know that if I put my third finger on the same note, that would then mean my first finger goes onto the E, and that takes me back to first position. So if I'm here... I'm trying to shift downward, I'll think about where my first finger is. I'll think about what finger might replace it, in this case, a third finger, and I'll replace that specific spot and rearrange my hand. So now, to first, you can see right there, it becomes my third finger, and then there. My first finger, my thumb, uh, build backward towards the lower position. And that completely extinguishes the problems with proprioception. Now, um, 
Replacement shifts versus compound shifts. What is a compound shift? Compound shift is anything that's outside of that three um, note range. So for example, again, if I'm in first position and I want to play in fourth position, totally fine. I can do a visual cue. I can listen to it using the model from the auditory cue. And I have a kinesthetic cue too. And then I can think, oh, I did it, yay. What if though, I have a first position to a fifth position, something that sounds like this, right? Here. That's where I no longer have a visual cue because I literally don't have a finger I can place there, right? And that makes it much more problematic. Additionally, um, because I don't have a visual cue, I also don't have a kinesthetic cue either. It's somewhere up here, I have to kind of guesstimate. So when people say shifting is done through your ears, that really applies primarily to compound shifts, right? You can get away with being deaf and still doing great replacement shifts. I remember a long time ago, I played a concert with a professor emeritus at University of San Diego, and we were playing the Mozart Symphonia Contratant. And if you haven't heard it, it's one of Mozart's greatest works, Violin, Viola, Concerto. Um, but he was going deaf, and uh, he would still nail these shifts in this piece. And I remember asking him, um, if you can't hear, how can you play in tune? And that's when I first learned that, you know, your visual and your kinesthetic sense is in some ways more powerful than your auditory sense. Now, having said that, again, compound shifts, they're totally um, auditory. However, here's a workaround to the complete auditory. So let's say you are deaf, okay? And you want to get from first position to fifth position. How might you do that? Well, I could say, okay, a compound shift is simply a multiple of replacement shifts. So if I went from first to third, and then I went from third to fifth, and then I could get into fifth position thinking of going through third and then through fifth, like this. First, third, fifth and then make that a little faster. First, third, fifth. And then hopefully, now that I have a little bit of that model in my ear, I'm maybe playing an upper string, I can get quickly to that spot. Um, also, another thing that's really nice is that you have a lot of weird stuff back here. You have the shoulders, you have the ribs, you have the crook right here of the neck. Um, you have all sorts of things you can feel and touch. And so, for example, fifth position, I know, uh, is best found by placing your tip of your thumb right here at the crook, right in the center of the neck, right where this little neck kind of turns into the body of the viola. So right there is where I think of my fifth position. So even if I didn't uh, have my eyes, I didn't have my ears, I could use my sense of touch and say, hmm, when did I get to this spot here, right? If I just put my thumb there, that's my fifth position. And another way I can use a visual is if I'm looking from bird's eye view, fifth position is about where your shoulders contact your neck on most instruments. I won't say all, okay? So you have to kind of figure out for what uh, your instrument is, uh, what works best. But it's kind of a good rule of thumb. Um, now, just one little note, if you're doing anything that's in fifth position or above, uh, it does require a different thumb position. So in general, when you're doing first through fourth positions, you're going to be doing it on the side of the neck, right? If you're doing fifth position, what starts to happen is the shoulder gets so big and you can't get around it. So if, if you see here, if my thumb is still here in fifth position and I'm trying to... I can't even get my fingers to get up and over this giant hunk of wood here. So I'm gonna need to kind of adapt to this. And so again, if you're first to fourth. See, even fourth position, which is still a thumb on the side, I'm still able to get a really beautiful shape. I can still vibrate. I'm touching, but not really, right? But fifth position is a totally different animal. So if you're ever in fifth position, you really need to be here so you can start to pivot on the thumb and get around this upper bout here, okay? Um, okay, so last but not least, uh, in a lot of styles, portamentos are uh, 
very prized. They express emotion and pain and um, a lot of romantic music uses uh, slides and glissandos and portamentos as we call them. So um, all you have to do is take your basic replacement shift, which again was to lift the finger to hear the pitch, bum, and then to, with the light bow, go up, once you hear it, depress the string back down, and then you have your new pitch. Um, with a portamento, you don't have to lift and you don't have to drop, so it's actually even easier than a normal shift. All you have to do is know where you're going, right? Bum, or visually where you're going, or kinesthetically, I'm gonna travel five gummy bears up to third position, right? And to just let it drag out. The longer it is, the more painful it is. Right? So you see that in bluegrass, uh, you see it in jazz, you see it in a lot of different styles. So I hope this is a good primer uh, for shifting for you. I hope it's been helpful. I know there's a lot of different concepts and I move very fast. So feel free to watch the video over and over um, and to take notes as you go through it. All right. Best of luck with your shifting.